All right, it's time to break down the film one scene at a time. Act one, why don't we set some shit up? Our story begins at a stately manor in Summersville, Ohio. Nick's character, Doug Chesnick, pulls up in the height of 1990s elegance and design, a gorgeous, brand newish Chrysler LeBaron <laughs> sedan. <laughs> oh, those cars were everywhere in the yeah. 90s. It's such an ugly car. <laughs> They're awful. <laughs> uh, it fits his character so well, though. Yeah. Inside, he makes his way upstairs holding a food tray with a big smile on his face. Before entering the room, he removes a pistol from his belt, knocks on the door, and announces he's there to say goodbye since he's going. I'm going. <laughs> uh, after he receives no answer, he leaves the food tray on a nearby table, takes his gun, and makes his way to the home's kitchen. He excitedly tells a group of staff members <laughs> goodbye, and next we see him smiling his ass off while drinking a Bloody Mary on a plane. We cut to a long aerial shot of the Potomac River in Washington, D.C., while the score goes absolutely <laughs> apeshit for some reason. <laughs> just raise the flutes and everything's just going nuts. Yeah, it does that quite a bit in this movie. It's whimsical. Mm -hmm. It's very whimsical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. It reminded me of Trapped in Paradise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was the same thing, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> we see Doug enter FBI headquarters where he tries to warn someone that a man named Ian Howe is planning to steal the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> I swear it's the same building. It probably is. <laughs> it's, I think it's like the Secret Service <clears throat> building that he yeah, goes into. Yeah, it's like their headquarters. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go to DC and you walk around that area where the FBI headquarters are, they like there's like 20 buildings that look exactly the same that are all headquarters of different mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Secret Service, the IRS, FBI. They're all like right next to each other. Doug meets the director of the Secret Service who congratulates him on doing a great job on a tough assignment guarding the former First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Tess Carlisle. He says he's hoping for a more active assignment, potentially back in the White House or in New York or L.A., anything not involving copious amounts of old lady farts, really. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, can you come in here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. What's that smell? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Been eating baby Ruth's again. <laughs> 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 the director asks how the first lady is doing, and Doug says she's a rotten old bitch. <laughs> no, wait. He says she's adored publicly, but difficult in private if you don't know how to handle her. And he knows how to handle her, obviously. So we see coming up. Doug says he doesn't envy the poor bastard who has to replace him, but goes on to say when he served for the former president, Mrs. Carlyle was a much nicer person to be around. But now she's like being around a schizophrenic. Or something to that effect. So she's got like multiple personalities. Yeah, she's got like seven personalities. I feel like she's kind of like bipolar. Or... I feel like it's the brain tumor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and depression. <laughs> yeah. You think maybe she can uh, move things alcoholism. with her mind? Like, Oh, that would have been an awesome <laughs> twist. <laughs> that seems to the be Shyamalan a movie thing. Movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the director drops the bomb that Tess called the White House the night before and asked the president himself to arrange for Doug to stay on for another tour, which I guess are three years at a time in the assignments. Doug is mortified having thought he'd finally escaped this shitty assignment, only to find out he has to go right back to it. He says he can't do three more years or even three more minutes guarding tests since it's the worst assignment in the Secret Service. <laughs> it's some, you I, know, love it's that. Like, I love that switch. Yeah. He's all diplomatic and speaking pretty mm -hmm. highly about her. And then as soon as he finds out, he's going back. Yeah. I can't do this again. It's the worst <laughs> thing ever. Gonna fucking smother her with a pillow. <laughs> going to kill her. Uh, yeah, it's kind of the, that way. He's like very like put together and... Uh, <laughs> very like focused and and very diplomatic 
And then he's not. Like he has his moments where he snaps and then he goes completely off the rails. I guess this, this, this is the early sign of that switch. Yeah. <laughs> the director says the president has asked for Doug to return to Mrs. Carlisle as a personal favor. And after a moment of contemplation as to whether he wants to say no to the president of the United States, we see him return to bumfuck <laughs> Ohio. Could be worse, I guess. At least he doesn't live in uh, East Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother can of worms up there. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Doug pops back into the house filled with Secret Service agents, cooks, a chauffeur named Earl, <laughs> etc. cetera. Uh, this is our first. Uh, we see each time that Earl is on camera, he kind of does something that irks Doug in some way. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, spoilers for later. <laughs> He pops in like he never left, and they're all surprised to see him. That guy who kept Harry Potter trapped in a closet under the stairs asks Doug if he's back to pick up his accoutrement. And Doug tells him to speak English, so he says, Just back to pick up your shit. <laughs> a little too in like an American accent. <laughs> you guys, it's just the comic relief yeah. throughout. Yeah. Which works sometimes, some of the time. <laughs> Doug yells at the chauffeur, Earl, not to smoke in the house, and he complains, uh, Earl complains that he should be able to since Tess never comes downstairs. <laughs> at this point, I think we're supposed to picture Tess as if she's like Howard Hughes hiding away, collecting her urine in mason jars or something. Because <laughs> they really paint her as just this hermit who never leaves that room. <clears throat> Fred, Harry Potter's uncle, Nicely decorates a food tray with a rose, but Doug rips the rose in half and pops the flower into his suit jacket, that little lapel thing, much to Fred and the chef's terror. Uh, obviously, this is like a daily ritual that's been going on for a very long time. Doug just ripped the rose in half. <laughs> Doug takes the food dish upstairs where he is greeted by Kimberly, Mrs. Carlyle's weird Aspie secretary. <laughs> <laughs> who is also shocked to see Doug back. She's almost just weird for the sake of being weird. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was to show that like Mrs. Carlisle is actually a good person and she hires these local people who may or may not be uh, yeah. the right choice for the job, <laughs> which right. her judgment on one of them is pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it seems like uh, – at first, when you first meet her, she's sort of like browbeat. It seems like she's she's browbeaten and silent because of how strong of a personality Tess is. But then mm -hmm. later on, you find out it's just that's just who she is. And Tess hired her anyway. Doug takes his gun off and knocks on the door. But once again, he gets no answer. So he angrily yells, breakfast. <laughs> <clears throat> you can tell he's making just, my he's breakfast. Just, <laughs> <laughs> he's breakfast. just fucking over it at this point. <laughs> you doing down here? I came my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> we hear Tess say, come in after Doug gets frustrated and Doug enters to see Oscar winner Shirley MacLaine aggressively filling a mason jar with pee while repeating, come in with the milk, come in with the milk, come in with the milk. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, she's, she's perfectly well kept and is oh clipping articles God. out of the newspaper. <laughs> Anybody see the aviator? <laughs> Come in with the milk. She pays Doug no mind until he drops some of her books she had on her bed on the floor and he leaves the food tray in the, in the book's place. <laughs> she picks them up and just drops them. He begins to walk out, but she stops him by saying, you seem to have dropped some of my things on the floor. <laughs> He begrudgingly picks up the books while she calls him a good boy, which obviously pisses him off. She asks if people still remember she even exists in D.C., and Doug asks her why the hell she forced him to come back. She says, because I like you, Douglas, and is sad that he'd ever want to leave her behind since she's such a treat to be around. He frustratedly tells her he wants to get back to his life in Washington, but she calls it a dead-end town for his career and that she needs him there. I think really she just, spoilers for later, she just didn't want anybody new coming in while she's dying. You know, 
Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Probably doesn't have much time left. I don't really know what the uh, the timeline, the overall timeline of this is. It feels like three or four months, maybe, because it's winter when it starts. But that's Ohio, so it could yeah. be yeah. as early as like <laughs> September, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we see Christmas go by, and then some more time goes by, and she's like freezing at the lake uh, before she gets kidnapped. Spoilers. Um, so I don't know, like three or four months. Yeah, I figured yeah, it was. That's what I'd think. Yeah. About four, four months or so. Yeah. I mean, when they show spoilers, the tumor in her head, it's pretty large. Like, she yeah, doesn't have a lot of time left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which really, I guess, uh, if you go by when we see that tumor in her head, um, it's uh, she lets Doug back in like within a couple of days, him and his team back in and then. The kidnapping happens shortly after that. No, mm -hmm. no, because she well, she goes to the the presidential library and. <clears throat> anyways, we're we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Yeah, but the timeline of this movie doesn't really matter. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> he tells her he came back of his own free will, which she calls bullshit. <laughs> he says he's an S A I C. So it's his right to refuse any assignment, and she condescendingly asks what the hell a sake is, <laughs> to which he says special agent in charge. This causes her to get all sorts of assholish and says Doug is only in charge because she forced him to come back and he has absolutely no free will of his own. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of true. He mm -hmm. is kind of forced into this because the fucking president is asking yeah. him yeah. to come back personally. He looks at her like he wants to blow one of her toes off with a revolver at point blank range <laughs> for a second before she says she has exciting news for him. She tells him she has an inoperable brain tumor, but he thinks she's just messing with him. She also says she bought he and his men a Scud missile launcher and she wants to go to the opera. Then says... Which one of those do you think is true? So, you know, <laughs> can't imagine why he doesn't actually think that she has a brain tumor. I feel like she does this a lot, just kind yeah. of screwing with him. But Oops. he he does seem to uh, react as if he knew something was up um, mm -hmm. when it's, like, revealed officially later on. Yeah. Uh, Which is funny because then we learned kind of like she didn't really want to go to the opera. So she was telling the truth. Yeah, I guess. Because <laughs> she falls asleep during it. <laughs> yeah. I think it's funny because she makes such a big deal about it being, you know, such highbrow sophistication, um, which coming yeah. up here. Um, but then she falls asleep during yeah. it. <laughs> so even she's just kind of bored of it. The mm -hmm. only person who seems to really enjoy it is uh, Uncle Dursley. Fred. Yeah. Uncle Dursley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He asks when she wants to go to the opera, and she says she wants to go to Columbus a week from Friday. He tells her it's nice to see her getting out again, and she says, that's very patronizing of you. <laughs> <laughs> then she makes fun of him for not liking the opera, and that he'd probably rather watch reruns of Mr. Ed, to which she says, I choose Mr. Ed in a second. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, Doug. <laughs> Oh, I also watched a lot of Mr. Ed growing up. Man. <laughs> I was on Nick at Night like every single of night. Of course. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't know if it was just I didn't want to change the channel, but like from like five o'clock <laughs> until like 10 or 11, it was just wall to wall. Like I love Lucy yeah. and Bob Newhart. I hated it. Mary I never Tyler watched Moore, any of that shit. all those things. I watched every one of those shows. <laughs> It's like, where's my all that? The fuck this? Yeah. Where's, yeah, where's hey dude? my all that? <laughs> Nobody's getting <laughs> slimed in this. I want to watch the Amanda Bynes show. <laughs> yeah. Where's Kenny McKell? Then she calls him Agent Dougie and tells him to put the rose he took off of her tray back where it belongs. And he storms out after angrily removing the rose from his lapel. Doug enters a nearby building that seems to serve as the former First Lady's Secret Service base of operation, and he's alerted that Mrs. Carlisle wants him to come back. <laughs> <laughs> to which he says, oh, come on, I was just up there. Just fucking with him nonstop here. 
got to establish that she's the antagonist, really. Mm -hmm. He bitches about having to come back and that she doesn't actually like him and how he's only there because she doesn't want someone new coming in and shaking things up. They're interrupted by a news report of Secret Service agents saving the current president from an assassination attempt, and Doug laments for the job he feels he should be doing rather than playing errand boy for a crotchety old lady. While all this is going on, Tess keeps calling on the phone for him to come to her, and he says he'll be there in 15 minutes. When everyone in the room implores him to go to her immediately, he says, What does she want? Chocolate? Some kind of goddamn food drink or something? What do we look like? Waiters? Are we a bunch of waiters? We want to be down there! (laughs) He's pointing to the (laughs) the Secret Service agent saving the president. Uh. Such an amazing, (laughs) cagey delivery. Yeah. He has a few of those. Kiss esque. (laughs) It's just, it's like ridiculous. I don't, it's like almost like he's like channeling a military thing, but at the same time, he's like losing yeah. his composure. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, an alarm goes off, and one of the other Secret Service guys runs to Mrs. Carlisle while Doug slumps against the locker and says, I can't do three more years of this. <laughs> when the Secret Service guy busts into Tess's room with a gun to see what the emergency is, she freaks out and says she told him never to bring a gun into the room and orders him out. I'm guessing that this happens all the time, so I don't know why he was so gung-ho to run in there. Uh, maybe he's one of the new guys. We see, uh, if you watch the staff, everybody like slowly changes in and out. Like uh, mm-hmm. Barack Obama lookalike guy <laughs> shows up <laughs> later on. And- Thank God you call that out. <laughs> that's the first thing I thought when I saw him. It's like, hey, yeah. it's a young Brock. And then like the guy, uh, Ralph, wasn't there earlier. So I think they just keep switching <clears throat> out the Secret Service guys. Though David Graff, I think, stays for most of the film. Mm-hmm. Not sure if he's yeah he's, he's in the there, final. He's there the final whole time. Scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, Doug arrives and scolds her for using the alarm since it's for emergencies. So she says she'll use it anytime she feels fit. <laughs> he asks her what the hell she wants, and she says to play golf. <laughs> so yeah, she's definitely a politician. <laughs> <laughs> she tells them to have the car ready in half an hour, and Doug patiently agrees. It's just, you know, uh, they, uh, Tess herself calls it out later on, but just think about how much money is spent for these jackasses to run around town golfing and all this kind of stuff. And like, who is who, I mean, it happens in the movie spoilers, but like who is planning to kidnap or do anything to some old lady that used to be like the president's wife, you know, I think this was supposed to be based on like. Uh, Jackie O a little bit, but you know, just kind of her having a secret service staff around her. And she, I think she actually dismissed them when she remarried. Mm. She didn't want secret service around her anymore. Mm -hmm. She had absolutely no privacy, just like Tess. Yeah. Uh, Though she kind of plays more of a Nancy Reagan. I feel like. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. She'd beat the shit out of Nancy Reagan. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, she would. She goes toe to toe. Which I would love to see. Uh, just anybody beating up Nancy Reagan would be oh (laughs) my god (laughs) Tess and her secretary play golf in the freezing Ohio cold while Doug and like five other secret service agents keep watch Uh, Tess bitches at an agent for standing behind her then scolds him for interrupting her swing and like because he he keeps going on about how he was because she's like didn't you serve for Nixon or Agnew or one of those guys. And he's like, I was too young. <laughs> like while she's in the middle of her backswing. <laughs> like that. Then she gets pissed at him. Like, <laughs> get it. Fucking here. kids. Get the cart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've experienced that at work, but somebody says something like that. Oh, I was too young for that. And you feel yeah. really mm-hmm. fucking old. Like there's a guy the other day old. who was like, I've never even heard of Frazier. Yeah. It's like I so you never thing. heard of it. You never even <laughs> it, heard that it exists. And he's okay. like, no. Yeah. And we're like, <laughs> it was funny because my manager was he's the same age as me, but he loved Frazier. He was like, it won 37 Emmys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say uh 
there's been a lot of that lately in my life. Uh, I'm getting <laughs> a little older, I guess, uh, but it's it's becoming more and more prevalent, like yeah. music, movies, and stuff. And one that really struck me odd was um, we were in San Francisco, and like uh, somebody wanted to go see the cable cars, and they're like, it just reminds me of that commercial, you know, the rice aroni. It's a mm. you know, San Francisco treat, and. Everyone in the office that was under the age of 30 had no idea what the hell that was. And I was like, okay. that was the most popular commercial on TV for like 20 years. Every day of my yeah. childhood, I heard that freaking jingle and nobody knows what it is anymore. It's crazy. Anyways, just three old men talking about <laughs> <laughs> better work. times. I really connected with Tess in that moment yeah. for that for that reason. <laughs> And I'm not even half her age. Yep. <clears throat> it's just going to get worse. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty soon they'll be like, what was the MCU? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's going to happen to all of you, by the way. It's not just us. It's going to happen yeah. to all of you. Name a thing you like, and 10 yeah. years from now, some kid People, will be like, they won't what know the what TikTok is. That? is. Yeah, yeah, for real, for real. On God, it's going to happen to all yeah. you kids out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No cap. <laughs> Eugene Tackleberry asked Doug why after five years of Mrs. Carlisle sitting in a room, she would suddenly want to go play golf and Tess tells them all to shut up. <laughs> Synchronized swimming. That's what's coming next. Tess shanks a ball into the woods and tells Doug to be a good boy and go get it. <laughs> he puts his foot down by saying, I'm a secret service agent, Mrs. Carlisle, not a caddy. You want that ball? I suggest you go get it yourself. (laughs) He goes on to say he intends to do his job by the book from now on since he's been forced to come back and that he won't be doing any more errands, snack runs, and that he won't be checking his gun at the door anymore. He tells her if she doesn't like it to call Washington and get a new Doug while she stares daggers at him. Later that night, he uh, confidently recounts the story to his fellow agents about telling her off at some diner, but is interrupted by a call from the president himself, who tells an (laughs) exasperated Doug that he received a call from Tess Carlisle saying Doug tore up her flowers. (laughs) feel like a goddamn idiot. (laughs) That's his go-to thing, the president. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He scolds Doug, saying he needs to get along with Mrs. Carlyle since her husband was the president when he was vice president. Um, that Tess also championed his nomination, and he owes her a lot of debt. He says if he gets any more phone calls from Mrs. Carlyle, he'll have Doug guarding his dog. And goes on to say he feels like a goddamn idiot having to call Doug about a goddamn flower. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I really love the the president's calls because they're like <laughs> they're always like very cordial and nice, but then he gets like a moment where he goes off the deep end and starts screaming <laughs> yeah. at him. Mm-hmm. And you can tell Doug is just like, oh, okay, okay, Mr. President. <laughs> yeah, they're great. <clears throat> yeah. And he's always shocked to get the call. Doug returns to his men with his tail between his legs and looks like he's on the verge of crying. <laughs> Uh, Tess gets ready for the opera while Uncle Dursley does a dance to some opera downstairs <laughs> for the wait staff. <laughs> it was this or the Goodbye Horses Tuck Dance from Silence of the Lambs, so I'm sure they're happy. <laughs> uh... <laughs> uh, what is, I don't want to see that actually no, no. <laughs> the, the secret service agents prep Uzis and all sorts of crazy shit To take the former first lady To an opera in Columbus, Ohio <laughs> But I guess given events we see later Maybe they weren't wrong to be overly cautious <laughs> I really want to see <laughs> Uncle Dursley doing the Goodbye <laughs> Horses stance <laughs> <laughs> uh, Would you fuck me, Harry? I'd fuck me. <laughs> I'd fuck me so hard. I'd fuck me hard. <laughs> Was I a great big fat person? <laughs> He's 
Does was she a great big fat? Because he's a great big fat person. You know? <laughs> they did him dirty by making him wear white the entire fucking movie. Yeah, it, it did not I think hide he's supposed anything. to be like her nurse. I think that's what's going yeah. on there. Yeah, I think he's her nurse. Yeah, but he never interacts with her. Like he never he goes, goes to up opera. to her room and helps out with her. No, he goes um, to the opera with them. But I'm pretty positive he's the nurse. That's why he's wearing yeah. white the entire yeah, time. Yes. I wonder that too. But yeah, yes, he he's her. They got the most unhealthy guy in Hollywood <laughs> to be her nurse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like when she checks out. Happy later on, she tells him to do some sit ups. Yeah. <laughs> Red, maybe some sit ups. <laughs> and he's like, "Would you fuck me? <laughs> fuck me hard." <laughs> Outside, Doug opens the door for Tess, but she wants to get in the driver's side. But uh, Eugene Tackleberry, I don't I don't think he has a character name. I don't remember ever hearing it. I just call him Tackleberry throughout the I whole thing. I can't remember. The only thing I've ever seen him in. Uh, he refuses to open the door for her since it's procedure to have her sit on the passenger side of the car, which I was confused about. Cause like Doug says he needs to be able to see the driver and her at the same time, but wouldn't it make more sense for her to be on the other side for him to see both of them at the same time? Yeah, he should. Yeah. 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 But I think cause he can always turn around and look and the driver can't safely do that. So if she's sitting directly behind the driver, the driver can't see her as easily gotcha. as a passenger. But the driver is not part of her security detail. He's just a chauffeur. Yeah, yeah but it could also service. just be he could see if she's taking her seatbelt off or doing anything else that's unsafe. I don't know, mm. but it makes sense to me. Maybe it's okay. a JFK thing. <laughs> God damn it. I don't, I don't remember where he was sitting. He was sat. He was behind sat behind the, uh, the, passenger. the passenger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Which that guy also got hit by the, mm-hmm. uh, by the phantom bullet that went up and down. Mm-hmm. The magic bullet. Yeah. All right, calm magic down, bullet. Oliver Stone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's pissed to have no personal freedom nor say even in where she sits in the car. She angrily gets in the car, but then quickly shifts to the other side back behind the driver. Doug tells the driver, Earl, to kill the engine until she sits where she's supposed to. <laughs> but she orders her driver to start the car if he wants to keep his job comes into play later on. Doug explains that she's not allowed to sit behind the driver in case of emergency, and she again refuses since she doesn't want the sun to be on her face. Uh, Like I said, this drive from Summersville to Columbus is only like 45 minutes. So, but, you know, know, she hasn't been out of the house in weeks, apparently, so maybe this is a big deal. I don't know. I think you would want some sun on your face. Doug gets increasingly more frustrated, saying they're not leaving until she's on the proper side of the car, which is behind him. Um, Things get real awkward, and after a really long beat, she tearfully relents and moves to the other side of the car. She got a feel for her in that moment. It was like, you know, (laughs) she just wants to sit where she wants to sit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, instead she gets treated like a child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's such a, like, powerful prominent you know figure in politics but she can't do anything you know basically can't even go to the bathroom without Mm. having to alert the freaking secret service about it so i get it i get why she's so uh confrontational with these guys (laughs) at the opera mrs carlisle sits in a private box while doug watches nearby with Cher. No, wait, no, wait, that's <laughs> God God right, but right behind her keeping watch. <laughs> it did remind me of that scene from mm-hmm. Moonstruck. Are they watching La Bohème? Yeah, La Bohème. Tess fights falling asleep and eventually she slumps in her chair while the crowd kind of starts to notice that she's fallen asleep. Uh, To help avoid embarrassment, Doug attempts to pull her chair out of view, but she is startled awake, shrieks, and drops her playbill off the balcony, which causes the whole audience to take notice. (laughs) She's understandably horribly embarrassed, as is Doug, and she tells him she wants to go home and that she'll never return to Columbus again. Not a big deal. Yeah. Or she can go watch an Ohio State football game. <laughs> <laughs> but go Buckeyes. 
Uh, on the way out, however, she's greeted by a crowd of people who applaud at her mere presence, and she turns on the charm. She smiles and shakes hands, then thanks them all for being so sweet, while the Secret Service agents try to stop some old lady from sneaking up with a shiv or a pen for an autograph. Uh, that was, you know, their biggest test they'd had in a long time. <laughs> yeah. Just walking through no, I this mean, Last time Cage was in an people. opera house, some guy tried to kill him and then he had to shoot him in self-defense. Or stab him in self-defense. Yeah, stab him. Beat him to death. <laughs> uh, Tess has a change of heart and says she wants to stay in Columbus. Now, since she's obviously, since she obviously craves the uh, limelight that she once had but doesn't have anymore. Um, yeah, we get that a few times throughout this movie. Of, like, she really enjoys... You know, having people dote over her and, and and adore her, even though she's a contemptuous bitch. <laughs> At the hotel, a fellow agent asks Doug why he doesn't just let Tess do whatever the hell she wants, since there's little to no chance she'll ever actually be in danger. Which is, you know, kind of true, but also, as we see, not. He says he's going to do his job right and with pride or not at all. The agent tells Doug this is a cupcake assignment and that he's let the job get too personal. And Doug seems to agree with that, at least at least a little. His uh, attitude changes a little bit from here. Mm -hmm. um, outside Tess's room, Doug sees that she's been drinking and tells the guy guarding the room to get rid of the evidence. Inside the room, we see Tess drunk on mini bar bottles watching a parade float go by the window. No, wait. <laughs> They're all blurring together. <laughs> oh, Didn't God. she have a real rocky relationship with her husband? <laughs> yeah, but he died of a heart attack in office. <laughs> Just weatherman. Here with the weather. <laughs> Act two. Let's get some motivation up in this thing. On the way back to Summersville, the detail stops for gas, and the two agents talk about how Miss Carlisle could beat the shit out of Nancy Reagan, which would be awesome to see. <laughs> <laughs> Tess asks an agent named Ralph to get her a baby Ruth, and she tells her driver Earl to gun it. <laughs> I was trying to think that she tells the driver Earl, hey, you guys. <laughs> 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 he tells her he can't, but again, she threatens his job and he agrees much to her delight. They peel out, leaving the secret service agents behind and they take off after her leaving Harry Potter's uncle, AKA the comic relief of the movie, AKA Fred in the men's room at the gas station. <laughs> By the way, if you look closely, there's a sign behind him that says Vernon's, which is coincidentally his name in Harry Potter. Yeah. I, I noticed that on the rewatch. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's weird. Very, those, you know, just serendipity moments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We cut to that guy who played a cop in every other film in the 90s, Noble Willingham, who puts Doug on speakerphone while the whole station giggles their asses off over their former first lady ditching the Secret Service. <laughs> this scene becomes way less funny when she gets buried in a hole later in the movie. Spoilers. <laughs> 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 picture them all giggling again. <laughs> oh, Later. wait. This, it's serious this time. Oh. Yeah. Later, we see a couple of police cruisers escort her and Earl home, and Doug loses it. He tells Tackleberry, I want you to go in there and tell Earl to meet me in the office. Okay? In another very cagey delivery. <laughs> when confronted, Earl tries to laugh it off since Tess ordered him to drive off, but Doug throws him against the locker and screams in his face. Who sent you, baby girl? Huh? Who sent you? <laughs> now, wait, that's uh, it's another thing. Deadfall. <laughs> <laughs> he tells Earl he's fired while he says he has no choice but to do what Tess wants since the secret service agents come and go. But he lives there permanently. It's all he's got. He's just a driver. Yeah. In Mrs. So it's, Carlisle's. So it's like the chef, the nurse, uh, and her secretary, secretary, and the chauffeur are her personal staff. Yeah. That the Secret Service can't do anything about. Which seems like a big breach of security to have four randos that. Turns out it is. Yeah. 
In Mrs. Carlyle's room, Doug asks if she enjoyed herself, and she tells him not to take that tone with her. She says she just wanted one hour of privacy, and Doug tells her he, he fired Earl since he's done this twice now, which we find out why he's been doing it. Mm. Take her to the doctor so that nobody else knows. Yeah. Uh, he says he is a driver in the employ of the Secret Service. I can't do anything about the cook and the nurse. No, they work for you. But this guy works for us and he's gone. So some some Very real cagey. cagey moments right here. <laughs> yeah. with this act and, and for the rest of the movie. She says he's her chauffeur and he's staying. And Doug says he can't do his job effectively if she doesn't let him lead the detail. And she tells him he can leave anytime he pleases. With tears in his eyes, he says thank you, tells her goodbye, slams the door, and leaves. She follows after him and says, if I promise to never run away again, will that do? He says what she did was crazy, and she tells him he should try doing something crazy like her once in a while and live a little, but he doubles down on his regulations. He argues that they are there to protect her, but she can refuse Secret Service protection anytime she pleases. He then crosses the line and she says she gets off on ordering around seven men and no women agents and having them at her beck and call all day and night. <laughs> yeah, that was a little <laughs> tad bit over the line. <laughs> yeah. You just want to order around a bunch of men and treat them like shit. I think it was in response to her, like telling him to get a date or has that happened yet? No. Uh, uh, it, in, she think, says it there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, she's emasculated him a little bit. Mm -hmm. so, I get the feeling that Doug's life is pretty fucking drab yeah. and boring. He's, yeah. He's probably very similar to like McConaughey's character in true detective <laughs> <laughs> goes home to a mattress on the floor and one <laughs> mirror on the wall. <laughs> That's it. I mean, we see him in his house a couple of times and it's just <laughs> a big empty house just so he yeah. lives in. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, kind of sad. I mean, his whole life is this job. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As that happens a lot with uh, these types of positions. Yeah. Either I'm surprised that he doesn't live there. Police and, yeah. It's just kind of weird that he lived off-site to me. Mm -hmm. Like, as the head of her security detail, you'd think he'd just live there for convenience. Yeah. Be there at a moment's notice. Right. Mm -hmm. But I guess they have other agents for that at all times, so... He doesn't yeah. have to be there. He's a supervisor. Shifts around the clock. Yep. Uh, she screams at him to get out, and he obliges. She tears up and grabs her head in pain. Pain. We see Doug on the toilet, where he gets a call from some guy named Santos. <laughs> that way, he gets another call from the president, who again scolds him since Mrs. Carlisle has taken Doug's suggestion and decided to refuse Secret Service protection. Then the president calls Tess a national treasure. Ah! And that Doug needs to fix the situation immediately. <laughs> Another browbeating dressing down from the president. Yeah. Calling him from Air Force One. <laughs> God damn idiot. While well, he's on the shitter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he pulls up at Mrs. Carlisle's house only to find all the agents outside the gates. Doug tries to get the chef to open the door, but he refuses. Then comic relief tells him he's holding Mrs. Carlisle hostage and that he wants a hundred dollars in unmarked bills, a helicopter matching sports coats and a copy of the movie Gigi. God, he's damn. a big Jennifer Lopez fan. Oh, wait, that's a different movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's Geely. <laughs> Earl greets Doug at the gate and Earl says Doug owes him an apology. Doug tells Earl to let him know if she plans to leave the house, and Earl reluctantly agrees. Doug and the two other agents decide to keep watch outside the house in their cars on the street to make sure she's safe. Later, Doug follows Earl and Tess, and she tells him to get lost. They follow behind anyway to an office building, where Doug again tries to reason with her, but she tells him to get away from her. Inside the building, we see Tess wasn't lying about the whole inoperable brain tumor thing, and that she's undergoing a CAT scan. <laughs> On a monitor, we see that she has a huge mass in her brain, and the doctor shakes his head as if there's no hope left. Or he just saw the score of the Buckeyes game against Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> also, no hope left. <laughs> Back at home, Tessa's secretary excitedly gives her a letter from her son, and we see her greet Barry, presumably days later, and she's over the moon to see him. He immediately launches into a sales pitch for a real estate investment, and she's gutted to find out the only reason he paid her a visit was to get her to endorse the project to help generate trust and interest from investors. She firmly tells him no, and he angrily storms out while Doug watches from a distance. I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be Doug watching, but it was like on a monitor. Mm -hmm. It was um, weird. But then 
the monitors are in the operation center, which is on the grounds, so he yeah. wouldn't have been able to see that from there. I, no. I don't know. I think it, we were supposed to be getting, like, his POV, but it was shot mm-hmm. like it was, like, on a monitor. I don't know. Yeah, it was odd. Weird. <clears throat> Maybe he set up his own set of cameras to, to watch from the car. <laughs> That's creepy. We, we cut to Christmas time where Tess watches old news reports from her husband's presidency with magazines of her days as first lady strewn across the bed. In a news report, the announcer seemed to make it clear that Tess was the real brains behind the presidency. And she spots Doug in the background of the video smiling at her husband. We see another news report showing that her husband died of a heart attack in office, and during the footage from the funeral, she sees Doug cry at her husband's funeral and realizes how much Doug cared for him. Although I didn't take it to her realizing it. I think she always knew this, which is why she always had him work for her. She just I I forget the feeling she does this a lot, this ritual of watching these old tapes and reliving the glory days, and so she always knew that we kind of learned that she had always had a soft spot for Doug because of how he was friends with her husband and she knew him from that time. Yeah. So I kind of felt like that's where, why she always requested him and, and wanted him on her detail because in her opinion, DC is a dead end town for career wise. And it's probably yeah. not great for and a she, lot of other agents. She does love him. I think, yeah. um, so she's looking out for him, but she's just one of those types of people who just constantly is poking you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just one of those, you know, personalities, <laughs> But I think, you know, Doug is kind of bored of this whole thing. I mean, he was the head of Secret Service or the president and then had to transition to fucking middle of nowhere, Ohio, (laughs) and guarding an old lady who probably Mm -hmm. doesn't really need to be guarded. Well, I guess she does, but (laughs) as we see later. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, she spots Doug outside her window in his car, drinking coffee to stay awake, and heads outside to greet him. <laughs> she, I love this part. She knocks on <laughs> his window and he pours hot coffee all over himself while screaming. <laughs> oh, God! Oh, ow! You scared me to death! <laughs> 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 After he freaks out about her sneaking up on him, she heads back to the house, but he stops her and tells her that he was wrong, which, by the way, I'll just point out spoilers. He was not wrong about anything. In fact, by relaxing his policies at this point in the film, he jeopardizes her life and basically ruins his own career and credibility forever. But anyway, she argues with him about how much money is wasted protecting political has and he tries to talk her into letting them come back to protect her. He asks why she came outside to talk to him in the first place if she wasn't going to ask for the detail to be reinstated, and she asks if he would like to have a cup of coffee. <laughs> that, uh, that line was great, too. <laughs> I was going to ask if you wanted some coffee, but... <laughs> or whatever she Obviously says. you have some. <laughs> it's all over his front. <laughs> spill over him. <laughs> <laughs> inside she says coffee keeps her awake so she'd actually like to have a drink instead he pretends not to know she has a drink occasionally and she says if i located a bottle would you join me for a highball they have a few drinks and argue a bit more before he suddenly flips the table picks her up and says son of a bitch <laughs> mrs carlisle asks where are you taking me and he says to the bed <laughs> <laughs> No, wait, he agrees to have a drink with her, and she talks about how she and her daughter barely speak, her relationship with her real estate mogul ghoul-looking son isn't much better, and that she doesn't really blame them for being screwed up since they grew up in politics. That guy was perfectly cast as a politician because he just yeah, he looks was. like a ghoul. Man. He's not even a politician. He's a politician's yeah, useless yeah. son who just does real estate deals. Does real estate, yeah. I think He's we're like, going for kind of a JFK Jr. Type yeah, thing. yeah. <laughs> She asks if Doug knew how much her husband relied on her while they were in the White House, and he says it was pretty common knowledge. She then asks if he knew about her husband's affairs, and it's clear he knew, but he didn't think she did. She asks for his indiscretion, and he says, you can count on me, to which she says, I know I can. Then she says, Douglas, we're getting out of here. And the next thing you see is him telling her a story in a bar about a girl who told him, I won't suck you. Don't ask me to suck you. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. All these movies, they really just do seem to blur together at this point. (laughs) It was weird, though, when he's in the middle of a sentence and then he's like, wait, that guy, that guy's getting a handjob down there. (laughs) (laughs) The guy getting a handjob at the end of the bar there. 
Then there's a guy quacking at a guy. I don't know. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> uh, oh, fuck. <laughs> So anyway, but they do head to some sort of a bar. What is it about drunks and wanting to go to someplace public to drink after having drinks at home? So do they enjoy paying five times the price and having to scream in a conversation over chameleon air blasting on the stereo? (laughs) (laughs) I've always wondered that about drinkers. I think it's just an excuse to go get social. Like it's more socially acceptable to drink when you're out somewhere. Yeah. Then I mean, just funner when you're out, I guess. But it's like if you, you're just having a nightcap, <clears throat> yeah. go out instead. Yeah, just go out. Which makes me wonder, like, what time is it? <laughs> yeah. He was like trying to stay awake, drinking coffee. Made me think it was like after midnight or something. <clears throat> and then she comes out. They have yeah. a drink in the house, and then they go out to a bar. They go to a bar. <laughs> Yeah. In Summersville, Ohio, I can't imagine there being many like 2 a.m. bars, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's just one of those like tropes. I guess script writers have to, if two characters are having a drink, you got to be at a bar, I guess. <laughs> They're going to have some revealing aspects of their characters come out in conversation. Yeah. yeah. Just like hearing a news report on a TV <laughs> <laughs> to tell exposition. She asks about Doug's life, and he says he pretty much doesn't have one. She knows that he was once married for seven months, so she obviously did her research on Nicolas Cage. I mean, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> he tells her everyone seemed to know what his ex-wife was like except for him, and it's embarrassing for him to even talk about. She says she won't say anything again and calls him Secret Agent Douglas Chesnick, to which he corrects her by saying Special Secret Agent in Charge Douglas Chesnick, Assistant to the Regional Secret Agent. <laughs> Next, we see that Doug's detail has been allowed to return to the house and Tess is, which I just wonder, like, so what were they getting paid this whole time that they Mm -hmm. still watched her for an indeterminate amount of time? You'd feel like they have some other kind of supervisors to report to and some other assignment they would get sent to. Now, I get the sense that they were never actually dismissed uh, Mm -hmm. because the president called him and was like, fix this right now. Oh, that's Mm -hmm. right. And so they officially were still on the books to be guarding her. They just couldn't be on the property because she didn't want them there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until she let him back in, which I think, you know, they were planning on waiting until she was back onto the property and all that kind of stuff. That's one of the nice things I like about toward the end of the movie. You can see they all actually really care about her. They're just trying to do their job and she just kind of makes it miserable, but they do still want to make sure she's safe and do their job. So. Yeah. yeah, like the the scene in the gas station where they're talking about her boxing with Nancy Reagan. They're talking about how strong and and like resilient she is, and mm-hmm. you know they obviously respect her and genuinely like her. So. Yep. But anyway, we see that Doug's detail has been allowed to return to the house, and Tess's staff want to know how he did it, and he answers that the simple answer is she likes me. Tess strolls into the kitchen wearing a red dress, which I'm guessing is like when Ron Swanson wears his Tiger Woods shirt since Doug cured that brain tumor of hers by slamming her head on the headboard all night. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> They're all shocked to see her downstairs and happy, but we quickly find out why. She tells Doug that the president is coming to Summersville for a visit and they're both super excited. Tess and the team all head to a presidential library in honor of her husband, and it's explained that the current president will be visiting to dedicate the final wing. She barely hides her excitement at the president paying a visit and suggests how the presentation should go down to the doofus who runs the library. And he doesn't seem that stoked that she's taking charge. (laughs) But Doug tells her he's excited to have his team tested and to put them back on their toes. And she says, so you think they're dull, too? (laughs) Set. Tess completely comes out of her shell and seems to feel useful again thanks to this whole affair. She starts dressing better, goes through her long neglected wardrobe, and even gets her hair did while Doug and his team are excited to be in charge of something bigger than grabbing Mrs. Carlisle a baby Ruth for a change. <laughs> 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 they go to the shooting range. Yeah. Get all the security detail. They're excited that the, the president's secret service are going to be taking orders from them while they're on site. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a whole uh, montage of. Uh, <clears throat> getting prepped mm-hmm. on both sides from Tess and from Doug and his yep. team. Uh, Tess goes shopping at a supermarket <laughs> and messes with the Secret Service guys by having them check the price of peas and forcing a Barack Obama lookalike to track down <laughs> someone who is smoking in the store. <laughs> <laughs> 
Unfortunately, after all that excitement, it turns out the president can't make it, but is instead sending the Secretary of Commerce in its place, and Doug is forced to deliver the bad news. He and Tess are both understandably devastated, but as in all cases in this film, they push on and do their jobs to the best of their ability, despite their constant disappointment. She gives a speech at the dedication and graciously introduces the random bureaucrat standing in for the president while Doug watches on proudly. Just kind of showing she was always that statesman. Yeah. You know, and she just needed to have the opportunity to do it again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think she really misses that uh, feeling useful. Yeah. Well, they talk about she was basically like co-running with her husband. So it's like yeah. she was the brains behind everything. And she's yeah. sort of just been relegated to a spinster living alone with nothing to do and no responsibilities and not an ounce of privacy at any point in her life. Yeah. I, get, I get the sense that that's a common thing in presidencies is like the first lady actually has a hell of a lot more influence than a lot of people think, especially if they're, you know, smart and not just a yeah. trophy wife. That's just there for appearances. Right. Not naming also, any names, but yeah. <laughs> but they also a lot of times, even if they are the brains, they just sort of have this public image of like they're only they're only good for being loved by the public and doing yeah. charity and stuff and outreach mm-hmm. and or like running something like um, <clears throat> uh, Barbara Bush was like the face of that like getting kids to read thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like some f- uh, philanthropic or charity organization stuff is all they're they're known for but yeah you know in the case of tess it was like no she she co-led the country she just nobody knows i mean i guess he said it was pretty well known so people did actually know but she wasn't publicly acknowledged for it it seems like yeah there was a news report where they said that she was like an honor student uh Mm -hmm. yeah straight a's and that her husband got like c's yeah and they went to they both went to the same college or whatever but she was like the valedictorian or something and he was just (laughs) <laughs> just barely graduated. <laughs> yeah. Act three. It's about time to wrap this thing up. All right. Everybody ready for this fun little comedy to take a gnarly dark turn, like possibly the <laughs> darkest turn you could take in a whole fucking comedy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, then here we go. <laughs> we see snow on the ground. So we know it's been in a, another time jump. Every, everything in the house has gone back to being quiet and sterile since Tess has presumably gone back to hiding in her room and only almost Barack Obama wanders the house. It's weird that he only pop like he first pops up in the store there and then he's there for the rest of the movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just assume like you said, they they're in the middle of a rotation of agents. Everybody's three almost, years is coming up. I wonder about that from a filmmaking standpoint of like, did they lose some actors along the way because i thought that they would want to like build up that relationship with these seven secret service agents but they keep changing them in and out true yeah doug is the only one who's like the permanent guy and what's his face tackleberry Tackleberry. (laughs) yeah tackleberry Uh, Doug heads to Tess's room where she says she'd like to go to the lake the next day and that she'd very much appreciate it if she could go to the lake with him and no one else from the detail. He agrees and takes a look at what she's watching on TV before jokingly asking if what she's watching is better than Mr. Ed. Playfully calling back to that argument they had earlier in the film. She's watching like the fucking Royals or some shit. <laughs> yeah, she was watching something at Buckingham Palace. Yeah, I was confused as to what that was. I, I'm assuming it was another like callback to her presidency. Like, yeah, like it was, was a visit hmm. with a president made to Buckingham or something. Go see yeah. the queen. Uh, she flips off the TV without even looking at him and sullenly slumps in her chair while he leaves the room. We see her at the lake eating by herself before Doug interrupts her and says it's getting cold. She says, will you leave me alone, please? So he returns to the town car where we see that Earl, her chauffeur, has also come along. Time passes and we see her asleep in her chair. Doug tries to wake her, but she doesn't move. So he checks her pulse and decides it's time for them to leave. So he carries her to the car. While heading to grab her chair, Earl once again guns it, leaving Doug behind. Oh, Mrs. Carlisle. She's such a kidder. <laughs> oh, wait, no. That's not what's happening this time. So hold on. So you mean we just saw an elderly woman with a brain tumor get kidnapped by one of her closest confidants? <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be a lighthearted comedy about a man cutting to the warm center of his insufferable bitch. <laughs> yeah, it's both. <laughs> it's, 
I liked it. I like this twist a lot. Doug hoofs it to a gas station where he calls Eugene Tackleberry, who says Mrs. Carlisle, Carlisle hasn't returned and neither has Earl. Hours pass and Doug decides it's time to let the brass in Washington know the situation, which Doug calls the worst moment of his life, which I really did feel for him and the team in that moment. Yeah. yeah. They, 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 I think they all did a good job of kind of portraying that, that defeated uh, energy yeah. and look. Yeah, I mean, this is the worst possible <laughs> fuck up they could have had. I mean, yeah. and it's happened twice before already. Exactly, yeah, yeah. That night, Doug's team and a host of Secret Service guys mobilized in Ohio to track down the former First Lady. Which I also liked that the movie kind of set it up to where you could still, like, think maybe he was taking her to the hospital or something because mm-hmm. Earl cares about her and, like, he knows that she passed out and she's had health problems, so... Like, maybe that's what's going on. You don't know as a viewer. And so you're Mm -hmm. sort of like the rest of the team just having to sort of wait for her to come back and then admit defeat when she doesn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, call in the big guns and figure out something else is going on. Yeah. Well, the team from Washington make themselves right at home in the Carlisle Manor. And Doug tries to get them to adhere to Tess's rules, but they look at him like he's an idiot. Oh, could you please put something down on that so you don't scratch the table? (laughs) I mean, you know, if and when she comes back, she's going to be pissed about that <laughs> stuff. So He's right. <laughs> yeah. They're all confused as to how this team of agents couldn't take care of one little old lady. And Dale Dye pops into the movie just to say, you disgust me. <laughs> Which kind of feels a little bit harsh, but I, I get it. <laughs> I would have been like, I would have been like, yeah, well, oh, he was the head of the CIA. He's, yeah, right? he's head of the CIA. I'm like, good job with the bad pigs. <laughs> or any other failed op that you guys have fucking had Jesus judge me <laughs> Dale Dye is um, he's a treasure man <laughs> yeah. he was like an actual uh, military guy and he became like a consultant for films I think Platoon was like when uh, he was first discovered and like they were like you know, you speak so well that it feels like you should just play the role. Mm. The same thing happened with Arlie Emery mm-hmm. yeah. Emery in, um, in the full metal, full metal jacket. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think Dale Dye is also in that movie. If I'm not mistaken, but he, mm. uh, he has a, like a major role in, um, band of brothers. That's where, I yeah. Know. Yeah. That's where <laughs> I, I, know him, I really know him from. Yeah. Every time I see him pop up in anything, especially in older stuff, I'm like, Oh shit, that's Dale Dye. <laughs> I think he's still around. I think he's still still acting. Doug gets a call from the sheriff who made fun of him earlier, and he alerts him that they found the car on a country road. Earl was found unconscious in the front seat, and Mrs. Carlisle was not at the scene, so they alert the president that Tess has been kidnapped. At the scene of the crime, Doug and his team aren't even allowed inside the police tape and have to stand there like a bunch of schmucks they are. Back at the Carlisle house, James Reborn, a.k.a. Agent Schaefer pops into their surveillance command center and tells the team that a syringe was found at the scene full of powerful sedatives and that the driver has burns on his neck, which they think is a brand of some sort of Middle East terrorist group. I, which, <laughs> I mean, why That's would they crescent, brand the guy and leave him alive? Crescent Moon. Crescent you know? Moon. <laughs> they have those crescent Muslims. swords. Pretty bad detective work by these yeah. guys. By the FBI, yeah. yeah. Well. Took Doug five seconds to figure it out. (laughs) He also drops the bomb on them that Tess has been dying of a brain tumor this whole time, which none of them knew. And that a note was found in the glove box demanding 15 million for her return. It kind of feels a little steep for a former first lady, but maybe they'll just say, call it, call it a two, you know, call it 2 million after a few (laughs) days, like Eddie King and Arsenal. (laughs) It's called a cool two million. Maybe Eddie Carsonal set this whole thing up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> turns out to be Eddie King. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Come on. Oh, you see Earl God. putting some visor in. <laughs> <laughs> Schaefer tells them all to go home, and in the car, Doug watches as a fellow agent lights a cigarette with one of those car cigarette lighter things that none of us know about because we don't smoke, <laughs> and now we just plug in our USB chargers to those little ports. <laughs> Anyways, he realizes immediately what caused the burns on Earl's neck and speeds back to the house where he tells Schaefer his theory. They head to if the you hospital. grew up in the 80s, <laughs> you definitely recognize that thing. because It's just crazy smoked. to think about, like, smoking was so ubiquitous that every car came with cigarette lighters. As a and it's the same way that cars nowadays come with USB 
hookups chargers. for yeah. 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 And they yeah, still I mean, have the cigarette lighter, but it's not used for cigarettes no, anymore. No, it's just used for oh. power. <laughs> I mean, they have the cigarette lighter hole, but mm-hmm. there is no cigarette lighter in I know. it anymore. <laughs> I think you can still buy them. I think you can, yeah. Uh, when I was there. researching, I uh, typed in if they have – I was, like, checking to see if I could find, like, an official name for them, and I found them for sale, and you could buy them huh. on to, like, get for your car. So, yeah, still a thing. It's a blaster in the past right there. <clears throat> yeah. They're fancy now. <laughs> <laughs> they look all modern. Aftermarket. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they head to the hospital where they ask to see the burns on Earl's neck. Doug stands over him like he's about to blow his toes off or something. It's a really weird look. And Earl gets increasingly more uncomfortable as they question him. A nurse uncovers Earl's burns and Doug matches them up with a cigarette lighter from the back seat of Mrs. Carlisle's town car. Earl spots the cigarette lighter in Doug's hand and knows he's, his goose is cooked. He thinks for a minute before saying, I hope you're not trying to pin this on me, and then blames Doug since he was the one who agreed to let Tess go in the middle of nowhere without extra protection. Earl then says Doug hated Mrs. Carlisle with a vengeance, to which Doug says, I actually like her very much. <laughs> hate her with her f- stupid fucked oxygen tube <laughs> sucking up all of her kids' inheritance. <laughs> I have to blow her brains out right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I did this scene did I, I said that in the text chain, but this scene definitely did remind me a lot of a bad lieutenant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Should have that big dirty hairy pistol yeah, the dirty instead hairy of his pistol. revolver. That's, that's all got. he needed. <laughs> Funny if Doug tucked it in the front of his in pants. Front. Just, like, <laughs> <laughs> just like He's hiding behind his the door hair. in the hospital room like a vampire when, <laughs> when Schaefer walks in. Just combing his fucking hair back. That's kind of a resort to the same tactics in this scene. <laughs> yeah, I, guess. <laughs> I guess that's where he drew inspiration from. He's like, well, I'll do this yeah. thing in guarding Tess. I'll do it here for so you. He, he goes a little further in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Er, Earl tells Schaefer about Tess tossing out the agents and how they argued all the time, but Schaefer sees through it and asks Earl why he's suddenly so upset. Then Doug makes his way towards him and says, you did it. Didn't you, Earl? And Earl tells him to get out of his face. And Schaefer says, Earl's now a suspect. And Doug asks, Where's Miss, where Mrs. Carlisle is? Earl says, speak to my lawyer, Agent Dougie. So Doug responds in the only way that one should. By pulling out his gun and putting it into Earl's head. Schaefer is, you know, remarkably calm about what's <laughs> happening right here. And, and just simply says, let's not do anything stupid here, all right? <laughs> it was almost like he'd seen that several times yeah. before. Well, I mean, he's part of that. Yeah, all right. This it's, again. Like he's, it's like nego- you know, negotiation tactics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stay calm, try to defuse the situation. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's not the first time somebody's put a gun in a suspect's face in front of Schaefer. <laughs> yeah. And it won't be the last. Doug again. Also, I kind of think Schaefer wants the answers too, but he needs well, to yeah. go by the procedure so he can't. Right. Yeah. He, can't he can't be, be the, the one, one that does it. He doesn't want to get, you know, his entire career ruined by something yeah. insane. <laughs> <laughs> Bat shit crazy. <laughs> Doug again asks where Tess is, and Earl says he doesn't know, so Doug cocks his gun. Schaefer says even if Earl tells him something, they can't use it, but that gets thrown out the window like 30 seconds later. <laughs> Doug responds by saying, I'm going to count to five, and then I'm going to shoot off your, your toe. Earl screams that he doesn't know anything, and sure enough, Doug blows one of his toes off. Yeah, that's right. Like He just <laughs> blows off Earl's toes with a pistol at point blank range in front of the director of the FBI. That's when Schaefer pulls out his gun and while sobbing, Doug tries to get the director to see it his way while a nurse calls the police and the FBI. Doug screams that if Earl is involved, then Tess knows it. So she's as good as dead. He counts down to five to blow off another toe while Schaefer prepares to kill Doug. But say what you will about his methods. Earl comes clean and tells them exactly where Tess is. Earl says his sister and her husband have Tess at an abandoned farmhouse and sobs while saying they made him do it. The FBI move in on the farm in classic 90s uh, movie <laughs> tropes. They like throw in a flashbang and it blows out the entire fucking room. <laughs> yeah. Then they're jumping through fucking windows. <laughs> and somehow they don't shoot him. Yeah, and somehow they don't shoot him. Which is it's like the most unrealistic house. part of this entire thing is that nobody <laughs> yeah. shoots the host- uh, the hostage takers. Yeah, they're like in a 
in a tiny little cabin. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like a makeshift yeah. cabin. On With this. a giant ass <laughs> barn behind them. Yeah. Anyways, they capture Earl's relatives and quickly find that Tess is buried in a hole with the PVC pipe as her only source of oxygen. Here's a quick fact. When rescuing Mrs. Carlisle from being buried, the breathing tube her kidnappers installed would have been far too long. She would have suffocated due to what's known as the dead air effect. A snorkel can only be a maximum of 16 inches before rebreathing more CO2 than fresh air becomes an issue. Uh, her breathing pipe was like well over three feet in that. Is that because CO2 is heavier than oxygen? So it mm-hmm. would just sit at the bottom of the tube and fresh air can't get down past so, it? Yeah. 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 It creates a, like a barrier. She's in there deep. I don't yeah. 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 I'm like, what? I can, we'll get into it later. <laughs> yes. I mean, I I'm think sure the whole plan was to just pull the tube up after a few days. Um, I think they were keeping her alive just in case they needed her for something. Um, but I think the plan was to bury her the whole time. Hmm. Yeah. Just pull that tube up, cover her up like she was never there. Mm -hmm. They'd never find her. Oh God, though. Earl's brother-in-law says Tess is alive. Well, he's pretty sure. Maybe. (laughs) Doug, the unhinged lunatic who fired a gun in a hospital, blowing off a guy's toes, freaks out and grabs the guy screaming. What did you do? What What did you do? What did you do? Take it up on Take it easy. Like, who the fuck let this guy back in there? Like, what, like, <laughs> wouldn't you yeah. remove him from the situation? Because he's <laughs> extremely yeah, I, don't, I don't understand why their whole team was allowed to just yeah. sort of hang around and keep <laughs> being part of the investigation where they're the ones yeah. that lost her. Yeah. Wouldn't he technically be under arrest for shooting <laughs> yes. a suspect? Yes, yeah, 100%. Uh, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense since they showed up with like 400 people. That trample all <laughs> over the crime scene. So yeah, I mean, destroy all the evidence. Yeah, I guess the more the merrier at that point. <laughs> I love that shot with like all of them walking down the hill. Walking down the hill towards the house. <laughs> it's yeah. all army. How many yeah. people do you need for this? <laughs> oh, fuck. Well, they dig up Mrs. Carlisle and realize the kidnappers were never going to let her out of this hole, but only planned to keep her alive a few days. Doug, who was thrown off the crime scene like two minutes ago, shows back up and asks if, if he and his team can help dig. And Schaefer <laughs> reluctantly agrees. I mean, like, couldn't have rounded up a backhoe or something? <laughs> yeah. Like... I kind of feel like time is of the essence and mm-hmm. maybe there should be a little more urgency on their part to get her out. <laughs> yeah. Of there. They're all just hand digging. Like yeah. it's just, <laughs> maybe they were worried about collapsing it. <laughs> yeah. They should just, <laughs> they're, they're fucking ass. Yeah, that, <laughs> they're my like guess dogs. is they were, maybe they were just worried about collapsing this makeshift hole that they had no guess, idea what yeah. the structure of it was mm-hmm. like. So. Yeah. They don't really know what's at the bottom of the hole at this point. The, yeah. They, they just know there's a tube down to her. Mm-hmm. Or how she might just be in the hole, you know? <laughs> yeah. What's in the hole? What's in the hole? <laughs> Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> they did a whole movie about it. Oh, uh, that's true. I forgot about that movie. Very. <laughs> <laughs> well, they finally get to her like four hours later and find her <laughs> unconscious in a wooden box. Doug yells, somebody get a power saw. And that's a young Barack Obama to fetch some soap. Water and blankets, so no one could see her in this state. <laughs> I, I, yeah, he just kind of like wanted to wash her up and make her. Yeah, but then they clearly show her just in a stretcher. Like the the EMTs aren't going to wait for her for them to like wash her face. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know, dude. They might. That's what's most important right now. Just <laughs> make sure you know not to make sure that she's breathing or anything. Just you know, she can't look dirty. <laughs> There's gonna be see him like on spitting on a washcloth. <laughs> <laughs> Get that hairdresser on the call. We need her down here now. Where's our hairdresser? Get her down here now. Her corpse can't look ugly. <laughs> uh, well, the FBI pull her out of the barn on a stretcher and put her onto a helicopter where all the top brass jump on without Doug and his team, who say they'll just drive to the hospital. The helicopter takes off to Jurassic Park music for some reason. I don't know if you guys da, noticed da, that, da, but it definitely sounded like the. <laughs> it, it sounded it very reminiscent of the helicopters from yeah. flying off from Jurassic Park yeah. or landing in Jurassic Park. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which only came out a year after this. So, Antonio's, or a year before this. So yeah. maybe they were trying yeah. to do an homage. <laughs> they definitely were. <laughs> Anyways, after that music starts playing. 
The helicopter quickly lands, and everyone on the ground plays a fun game of telephone as they call for Doug to get to the chopper. Tess says she's not going anywhere without her security detail, so they all the top brass have to get off the helicopter to make way for Doug and his team. All the higher-ups give Doug a look, including Dale Dye, who spits in Doug's face and says, You disgust me! And Doug's just kind of like, blows off one of his toes. It's kind of a <laughs> weird fucking moment, but I guess. <laughs> no, that last part didn't happen. But they do give him looks of disgust, like, oh, fuck this guy and his team. On the helicopter, Tess asked how long it took Doug to figure out the cigarette burns and scolds him for taking so long. Then she pulls his face down onto hers and they share a passionate kiss for like way too long and like fucking tongues everywhere too. Wait, no, that's just a fanfic I'm writing. Well, well a Whitney Houston song plays. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, Same no, thing Schaefer happened t- in Driving Miss Daisy. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> No, what actually happens is Schaefer tells her the only reason they found her is because Doug shot a man in the hospital. (laughs) And she's stoked that Doug finally got to fire his gun. It's just fucking just fun stuff all around. (laughs) Later, we see Tess getting ready to leave the hospital where she gets a call from the president. She tells him she wants Doug taken care of. And the president says Doug fired a gun in a crowded hospital. But since he saved her life. Doug is like a sunder. Uh, she also tells him if anything happens to her, she wants Doug to be looked after. And then she just hangs up on him. Like a real she's power like move right there. The only person who can browbeat the president. Who mm-hmm. <laughs> He's like, see uh, just browbeating uh, Doug a couple of times yeah. in the movie. Yeah. He's like, uh, uh, <laughs> can see uh, why uh, he's uh, the one. Yes, who, <laughs> yeah. He's like, she, uh, yeah. I was going to say like, she always reads him the riot act, which is why he always has to call Doug and complain about it. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 him the riot act, yeah. <laughs> It's true what they say. Shit rolls downhill. <laughs> Outside the room, Mrs. Carlisle protests that she's not leaving the hospital in a wheelchair while an orderly argues that it's policy. Doug giggles while listening to the argument for a minute before whistling and saying, the regulations aren't really that sacred, are they? To the orderly and then pulls down his sunglasses like he's checking out the Willie's Wonderland sign <laughs> before saying, and Tess, get in the goddamn chair. <laughs> What's yeah. funny is he just... Like, went through this major horrible ordeal that would have been prevented had he followed the regulations that he was so strict about at the beginning. And now he's like, the regulations aren't that strict, are they? (laughs) Well, it's it's character growth. Like, there's some things you can fudge. She can clearly walk out. If he had followed the regulations, he wouldn't have shot the guy's toe off to get the information out of her. (laughs) Or to get the information out of him to find out where she was in the first place. Yeah. But then also, he talks back to her, you know, calls her Tess for the first time in the movie. The only time in the movie. Yeah. 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 So sort of to show the completion of his character arc. Like, (laughs) yeah. yeah. They're, They're friends, and he doesn't have to be so anal about all the regulations mm-hmm. well so she's take- gonna give her the anal later <laughs> <laughs> oh god damn wear it. that red dress into the kitchen again <laughs> oh my god <laughs> bring the cigarette lighter <laughs> <laughs> she's taking a back but reluctantly gets in the chair where she smiles to herself and pats doug's arm while saying very good douglas Outside the hospital, the press are waiting and applauding the former first lady for having not been killed. And she blows kisses <laughs> at them. Happy to be back in the limelight for the last few weeks of her life before dying an agonizing, painful death from a brain tumor at the size of a golf ball. <laughs> the end. Happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you just don't think about it, it's a pretty happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 